these actors, um, the task they have at hand is this to embody, inhabit these incredible screen icons, all, all of them. Um, and um, when we went to work, the main thing we kept talking about was how to do that, how to embrace what's there originally, because that's what I had to do as a director, but yet make it somehow theatrical and to own it and to own it and make it your own. As Bob Gale, our creator, our inventor, <laughs> once said, people just want to feel that feeling they had when they saw that original story. Well, as we get started here, I have to say, what a thrill ride you all take the audience on. And a lot of that is because of director John Rando, who is here. John, how did this musical come about for you? And what made you say, yes, I want to direct this? Uh, what made me say yes was, um, I just simply think it's one of the great stories. It's such a brilliant story. Um, you know, I had seen it in 1985. And, um, you know, with everybody else on the planet, just so loved it. And when Colin Ingram, the producer, came to me um, and said, hey, uh, what do you think about doing this as a musical? I said, absolutely, because it has this enormous mountain to climb. <laughs> you, uh, the, uh, Mar getting Marty back to 1985 and this incredible love story that is on, plays on so many different levels. First, of course, between Marty and Doc themselves and their, their relationship, which is such a beautiful relationship. And then on top of that, there's you know, Lorraine and George and their relationship. And then there's the spirit of, of, just, of just doing things if you put your mind to it and you know, embodied especially in Goldie Wilson, that character, and just the idea that you know, I'm gonna be mayor and he does become mayor. It's, just, it's an extraordinary journey. And I just thought this will make a great musical. And you know, we also uh, have done really well um, with the technical end of all of that, because that's a very complicated thing to do. Oh. But first, and as always with musicals, it's about the music, the brilliant Glenn Ballard, the, the songwriter, and of course, Alan Silvestri, the uh, film composer, and then who was with us hand in hand creating this uh, wonderful musical. And uh, so that, that we had to do that first. And once we did that, then we could focus on the fun, you know, the fun stuff of trying to make a car fly. <laughs> Which you did beautifully. Now, you're all perfection in the show. So for the cast, what is it like living in the world of Back to the Future, the musical, and what has made it so special for each of you? Anybody can start. I think ladies first. Oh, wow. And thank you for that. No, I think um, I personally just feel so lucky to be a part of this um, franchise that is so well-loved. We came into this musical with this huge fan base, excited to show up, ready to show up, ready to buy tickets, who'd been dying to see it. I mean, you don't get that chance very often to open a musical knowing that people are already excited and, and ready to see it and hoping to see the characters they know and love and, and dreaming of what we could do with the car and then getting to meet those fans at the stage door after and they're not disappointed. Their, their expectations have been exceeded. So I feel very lucky to be a part of a show that's already loved and people are excited about. I mean, that yeah, it doesn't happen all the time. Beautiful. Who wants to go next? Well, <laughs> you know, I was scared to audition for this show because I love the movie so much, you know, and to step into this, these iconic characters was something that put fear in me. <laughs> and you put it off and you put it off. And then I, I got the song that I'm supposed to sing, which is you got to start somewhere. And it's like, well, well, there's the message <laughs> of it all. So let me dive in. And then I walk into the room of of Colin and John and Chris Bailey and our producers. And it was just a room of people that I've met um, in different stages of my life. And I felt like they're all rooting for me. So it just felt like the perfect recipe to, to start this process. And then I got to start the process with these phenomenal human beings and sort of dive into the art of it and fell completely in love with the show, the craft, and, and just the spirit of what we get to do on stage at the Winter Garden. Beautiful. I think um, it, less than uh, getting to be in Back to the Future, the musical, it's more getting to be inside that film 
and you really feel like as the actor you are inside the film because lots of other musicals that I've seen or shows that I've done you don't feel like it's a very unique experience in our show for anyone that's seen it because of the beauty of the underscore by Alan Silvestri and I remember very vividly doing the rehearsals in London we were doing the punch uh, where George punches Biff and Alan was sat there with like a tiny little MIDI keyboard which was very funny and uh he was like, well, maybe I could put this underneath it. And it was the score from the film. And I, even on a MIDI keyboard, it's like, okay, that was cool. And then we came back and did it again. And it feels like you're in the movie. And that's a very rare thing because obviously you do, when you're on set, you're doing it and there's no underscore. There's no nothing. It's just silence. Even the, you know, supporting artists are just going, so there's absolute <laughs> silence. But when you're on stage and you have the swelling underscore, that is an incredible uh, feeling and privilege for an actor because you just you don't really have to do anything you just ride the incredible music um, and that's every night that never gets boring yeah um, it's just magical getting to be able to tell people what you're doing and they get what it is um, <laughs> I mean it's that simple it's like really like there's like a lot of you know Broadway's a, a um, has always kind of been uh, the nichest of of art forms and um, I just like being um, in this kind of forefront of making it a little less niche and 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 bringing a larger audience to to Broadway. Beautifully put. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I don't, yeah. Okay. No yep. problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. we're good, Roger. Thank you for You're being wrong. here, though. We appreciate it. I just <laughs> love the movie, and I'm just so happy to be in it. <laughs> Come on. No, really. No, it's, it's yeah. very cool. You know, the the this, 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 I could talk for an hour about why because there's yeah. so many elements that are very cool, but. But uh, I, I personally loved the challenge of um, of both the, um, the the science side and bringing that to to the stage for 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 uh, you know I come from a big geeky family, and also the old fashioned beautiful love story that unfolds in front of you that's so that we kind of circle around a little bit dance around a bit, and um, and then it, it just so simply shows and the story so so simply. Uh, uh, touch on on themes that are things that I were very deep for me growing up. That I, with what happens with George and with and with his his girl and um, and then I've also just loved the idea that uh, about this relationship mostly because mentorism is something that um, it has broken down in our culture. I think over the last uh, 60, 70 years and there's the idea of this friendship and this between an older man and a younger man that is about uh, is a great friendship with a lot of commonality. Um, but that is is beautiful, and we we kind of teach each other. It sort of expands on the idea of uh, of mentorism and promotes that, which I think should be a beautiful thing in our culture and and celebrated more often. Yeah. Can I can I just add one thing oh, yeah, totally. really quickly, yeah. which is that you know uh, these actors, um, they I consider them incredibly remarkable. The task they have at hand is this to embody, inhabit these incredible screen icons, all, all of them. Um, and um, when we went to work, uh, which both Hugh and Roger were there at the very beginning when we were workshopping the play back in 2019, 2018, um, the main thing we kept talking about was how to do that, how to yeah. embrace what's there originally, because that's what I had to do as a director, but yet make it somehow theatrical and to own it, and to own it and make it your own. And the combination, I just love this. And this is what actors do so well. I mean, the examples are infinite. Um, you know, even in recently the, the Leonard Bernstein movie, right? Um, um, you know, actors are always doing this. But when they do it the way this group does, it's just sublime because you're getting both what you remember, if you happen to have seen the movie, we have plenty of people that have never seen the movie and they come to see the musical and they flip over it um, because they're experiencing, as Bob Gale, our creator, our inventor, once said, people just want to feel that feeling they had when they saw that original story. And that's what we try to provide. And these actors do that and they do it with such integrity and such joy. And uh, it's, yeah, as a director, I'm truly blessed. Beautiful. Thanks, John. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I want to talk to the cast about that. Um, you know, you have each taken on these iconic roles who we all know from these films, yet you pay such a beautiful homage to them and you bring yourselves to this. So like Jelani, you were saying you were terrified to go into audition for this originally. 100% yes. <laughs> because it's not just one character, it's two. Yeah. 
you know, you got to be Goldie Wilson and then Marvin Berry. So how do you make those different? How do you make it unique? And how do you make your, how do you find yourself through that as well? So that's been a wonderful task and journey and exploration. And it, it's, it's, it's the why it's, it's so much fun to sort of dive in and then figure it out and make John laugh. Yeah. <laughs> my, I just want to say that my wife, we, we watched the, the play the other night cause uh, we had Al Roker in it for one night and she turned to me and she said, wait a second. Jelani does both those characters? Is that, that's right, isn't it? She's seen it maybe 18 times. And I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> yes. She said, he's remarkable. I owe it all to Roger Bart. Yeah. <laughs> well, so each of you talk about, I mean, when you went in, Leanna, like, were you like, oh my gosh, I'm going in for this iconic role of Lorraine? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, when I got the audition, I hadn't seen the film in years. Yeah. And I was out of town working on something else and I was going to have to rearrange a bunch of travel stuff. And I was like, let me just sit down and watch the film again and see what it brings up. And I watched it. And while I am hugely intimidated by Leah Thompson's brilliant performance, I just also had this feeling. I watched it. I fell in love with the character of Lorraine as an adult. I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. And I had this feeling in me and I was like, I have to go in for this. And it ignited something in me that... I wanted that challenge. I wanted, I, I, I feel like I was like, I understand the assignment. I think, I hope <laughs> where, you know, the challenge of honoring what she created. So the fans see the, the character that they know and love, but also infusing it with me. And I saw myself in her and I just, so I was scared. Yes. Intimidated, but excited. And I, I had this like warm feeling in me that I was like, I need to go in for this. I want to go in for this. <laughs> Hugh, for you going in for George McFly, I mean, we all know the iconic voice and the person who played him. Intimidating at all, or what made you say, I can do this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I still don't think I can do it. Like, if, <laughs> I don't think you're a very good actor if you're sat in your dressing room going, I'm going to nail this. <laughs> Especially if you're going out in front of 1,600 Americans standing like this. There's a lot of sort of quaking in the, in the dressing room. Tonight's going to be the night they find out. They'll storm me. He's British. Um, <laughs> I, I find that um, it, the the film and George, Crispin Glove is the is the best character in it. Sorry, is the best performance in it. Um, <laughs> and so to, 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 for the people who watch that film the first time, the, the character is so idiosyncratic and so indelible that you know from the outset that you need to capture some of that. You have to have an outline of that in order to facilitate the very important story that the actor connects to because impersonation is not acting. It's a circus show and it's boring. Like if, if you got up there and you just did the Chris McGlover impression, people would be like, oh great, it's just like the movie. But that's not interesting to the actors, right? You want to find that story of, then that's what I connected to uh, uh, beyond the sort of surface level of the voice and the movement and that sort of stuff. That's great. But what I, sort of hook into every night is this guy who can't talk to girls at school, doesn't want anyone to look at him. And I was like, cool, that's me at school. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And you get to like exercise this demon and through the prism of all the fun stuff, like the voice and the, it's really fun to do, but that is not what matters. You need to do that to get the fans on your side in the first 10 minutes. And once you've got them, you go, great, here we go. And you take them through this story and that's, that's what I wanted to do with it. You know, it wasn't the, obviously the, the outwards and the voice and the everything intimidated me, but that wasn't what was important to me. And I was like, I want to get the story. I want to get this guy. Um, and that's what I'm sat in my dressing room fretting over every night. It's like, how do I convince them that, you know, something is happening when it's not happening? That's the job of the actor. Anyway. Beautiful. Casey, for you, taking on Marty, the iconic role. See, he is, he's very charismatic in Not real totally. life. He's very funny. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I thought, I just, um, I just uh, saw the, the um, call that they wanted me to come in and I was like, I, I, I just assumed what's, what's kind of great about how big of, a, of an ask it is, is that it is so impossible that it actually makes you not nervous because you're like, well, I mean, no one is going to be Michael J. Fox, so uh, I, there's no reason to be nervous. Um, and like Hugh, Hugh and I have both shared this. Um, we both tried our voices five minutes before the audition. Um, and I don't know, I was just something in there, uh, that I think just kind of lived within me a little bit. Um, uh, I watched the movie a lot when I was younger. I watched it once after I booked this job and I haven't watched it since. Um, 
I think it just kind of lives in us, kind of like the national anthem if you're American. Like, it's just like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's this movie that is like, you know, am I wrong? Um, and I, I think I think what Michael de- did in that uh, also lives in us, um, for sure. And I think what he has done as a person since uh, even uh, makes Marty even more of a hero. So I think the biggest thing... Um, about Marty to me was uh, to be able to capture the feeling that Michael J. Fox gives you um, through all stages. Um, From the very first second that I come out and you recognize the voice cracks, hopefully, (laughs) um, and then all the way to the end when you connect with this friendship that Roger was talking about. And, and you believe that we have a very different relationship than, than um, Christopher Lloyd and, and Michael J. Fox um, in our musical, but it should hopefully give you the same feeling that um, that, that, that relationship gave you in, in the movie. Um, so uh, much like, like Hugh's work, I, 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 I try to hook you with hopefully the things you remember of Michael, and then throughout the story, I put myself in it and um, what I share with, with Michael, hopefully. Um, yeah, hopefully that works. <laughs> Roger taking on Doc Brown. Yeah, I, th- I think every, everybody said that all yeah. I echo all of the, the, the comments that everyone has made about, about this, this kind of endeavor. Um, and, um, I love the movie. I've always loved Chris Lloyd and, and I, and I'm, and I'm always game for a mad scientist. Um, <laughs> but there, there's something about like also just, there's a quality to this character that reminds my parents were sort of off, you know, they they were both chemists and, um, very, very remote people. And, um, and my, you know, my old man retired at 59 and just, you know, pruned bushes. Um, so, and he was brilliant, you know? Uh, um, so it was, it's interesting to be uh, playing somebody who celebrates um, their personalities and their um, and their um, you know their 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 being loners to some extent um, and um, and uh, so it's loved it's it's fun to pay tribute to them and and of course I've said so many times about Chris Lloyd you know I love him and yeah. everybody here adores the people who play the parts in the movie so we just we just try to to send them a note, you know, through our acting that says, God, we love you. And we, we, we want to do you honor and do this, this great story honor and have fun and bring joy to the audience. And so all of those things were part of it when I first saw the movie and when I first read the script and first had the opportunity to do this, we just brought joy. And I'll, I'll never forget the very first night we put it on. We've been working really hard. We were in Manchester, and and you probably got a visit from Rando too. Um, but right after the show, John was so tired. You know, he had been putting this thing together. He's been sleeping very little. We had so much pressure. We were so kind of behind, like we often are. And John came in with <laughs> with Bob Gale and just screamed. Ah! And he was so happy uh, because the audience and and our and the hardcore fans. They came to Manchester to see the movie for the first time, saw our show, and basically freaked out. It was, it was like a, it was such a wonderful evening, and I'll just never forget John's response. Yeah, well, they flew, they flew in from all over the world yeah. to Manchester, oh, yeah. and this was two weeks before we got in the UK shut down. So we did yeah. press night. The next night, it was go home, yeah. and you don't know what's going to happen after that. And I remember that's still the best stage experience and one of the best experiences of my life. Because like Roger said, you've been working on this thing for two, three years at that point. Yeah. And we deign to believe how great it is. You know, I, you, you you question your own performance, but you look around, you go, well, they're pretty good. And they're not going Ugh, when I talk. So <laughs> I must be in that company. And, but you don't know, right? You don't know. And that's like we said, the first answer is like, this film is so important to so many people and you don't want to go out there and screw it up. And, uh, I remember the, the the last moment of um, that show that Roger's referencing, we were actually directed to be in the centre, John, do you remember? And I was stood there with Rosanna Highland, just playing Lorraine at the time, with my aviators on. And the great thing about theatre lights is you black out, but they don't black out immediately, right? It goes black out and then... Shoo. And I remember it was... Dun, 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 and I whipped my glasses off, black out, and I just saw front to back, vroom, straight to their feet. And I'll never forget that. I was just looking at the very back row of the back row and it was straight up. And that's what you were talking about. And I'm sure what John and Bob were kind of intimating with that ah! when they came back. But that was a really special um, moment. Yeah. John, what do you remember about that night? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, what, <laughs> a detail, <laughs> which was at the party. Uh, <laughs> Hugh actually 
uh, dressed as, um, you know, the the actor. Um, Crispin Glover. I dressed, Crispin I dressed Glover. as Crispin Glover on Letterman and when he tried to He dressed up as him on, a, on The Tonight Show. The Late Show. The Late Show, yeah. yes. An infamous interview he had on The Late Show where he sort of freaked out. I mean, he literally <laughs> wore the same crazy pants, the cra shirt. It was so funny. It's so mind-blowing. Also, that night was the night that um, they were going to close the, uh, you know, the, the airports. Uh, so this was one o'clock in the morning, Bob Gale running up, you know, we were partying like crazy and Bob Gale running up to me and say, John, they're closing the airports. They're closing the airports. We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. And then, yes, yeah, so it was, it was, it was just wild. And then, and then what was so great, it's like, okay, Bob, the party ended. This was like one thirty, and it was freezing cold. And we go to a pizza pub that's, you know, <laughs> Manchester, right? Pizza pub, really small, right? This is the, the pandemic, people. But we're m packed into this pizza pub, drinking beer and celebrating. And I thought for sure Bob Gale had gone to uh, gone to the airport because he was so, you know, terrified. And and then he comes comes wandering into the bar and like, give me a beer, it's pizza. <laughs> More celebration. Anyway, yeah, that was, a, that was an extraordinary, yeah, great, yeah, great. Yeah. Where did you get that outfit from? Yeah. The Crispin Glover outfit. That was weeks of preparation. <laughs> okay. And uh, I don't know if there are any Back to the Future fans in here. I will tell this story. Obviously, there's, let's call it friction between Bob Gale and Crispin Glover. And um, I walked into that party dressed as, in my eyes, the iconic Crispin Glover when he went on The Letterman Show and tried to kick David Letterman in the face and got kicked off. <laughs> Look it up if you haven't seen it, it's incredible. Um, and I walked in and the first person I saw was Bob Gale. And I went, do you know what I am? And he went, yep, <laughs> I know who you are. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> do you still have the outfit? Um, I don't, because I was going to wear it to um, opening night, but uh, yeah, no, that was a one time only thing. I think that was. <laughs> Thank God. John, to this one. John, you have worked on some very big musicals, but this one is epic. Mm. I would think the biggest question early on was how do you show a car reaching the all important 88 miles per hour required for time travel mm. when you only have the width of a Broadway stage? Mm. I want to give a big shout out to the entire creative team of this musical. They are amazing from everybody who, yeah. just, who has worked on this show. Yeah, that's Tim Hatley's yeah. uh, set and uh, costumes and uh, Finn Ross video and projection yeah. and uh, Gareth uh, Owen sound, which is just remarkable too. And then of course, Tim Luckin and you, Van Stone lighting, all Brits, but all great guys yeah. and really <laughs> sweethearts. So yeah. let's go back to the car when, yeah, when, yeah. when so, all this was so, coming together. Like it's so such a cool thing. We yeah. we we really, you know, we were we were developing them. We were, you know, rewriting and rewriting and and um and, and doing lots of songs, lots of songs. And, uh, um, and we, we weren't, I wasn't going to work on it. Uh, technically, I just couldn't even begin to start to do that. So we spent a year just developing the show. And, um, and I think honestly, it was when, uh, uh, Glenn Ballard wrote um, for the Dreamers this oh. song that Roger sings, which is just a remarkable song, and uh, and he played it for me and Bob, uh, you know, in his studio in Hollywood on on his on his piano, just kind of sat there and and sang it. And of course, I was just completely moved and and really excited. And then uh, it clicked. Oh, I know where this is going to go. And we we worked we workshopped it and we got it into the scene because Roger really wanted the scene with the model. Originally, it wasn't in there. And um, Bob was like, you can't have the model. It's all over the floor. And I said, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> and we did, of course, with this funny Tim Hatley genius little flip. So once we had that, once we fe felt like we had the heart of the show, the real yeah. musical heart of the show, we could focus on the car. And um, just really, you know, there's so much, that could be a whole other thing. But let me just go quickly through it as uh, best as I can. So the car... The car is only is eighty percent the size of a normal DeLorean or a normal car. We couldn't, if we had a full size car on the stage, we couldn't do everything that we want to do with it. It just, just the proportions wouldn't work. It would be just too much car. Um, so we knew that we were going to have a little smaller. And you've been inside it. You know that it's a little cramped. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so. Um, I, the only way to just, it's just to describe the first time I actually we were actually working on it, which was before we did the production, the, we had uh, some technical workshops. The first time we did this, we had this, um, you know, sort of weird video projection in a, in a studio space, and we had a wooden car. We had a wooden car that we would 
push around and make do different things. And we had this projection behind it. We also had a scrim in front of it. And so we started to figure out how the car would work with that and could we make it move? And we literally had stage managers shoving it around. <laughs> and um, like, and, it, and you know, we're, you, I mean, literally, if you had just walked in and saw that, you'd go, oh my God, that looks just terrible, so stupid. And we were all like, yeah, we got this. <laughs> we got this, we know how to do this. So then the next step was to actually build something. Yeah. So we built the deck and we built a chassis for the car, a kind of weird little version of the car that would eventually become the car. And, um, and then we got, into the the we got into this large theater, empty theater space, and something happened that I hadn't seen yet. Now this is the same time that the Mandalorian is, is, is having, having its first um, you know, uh, season. And um, Finn Ross, the, the uh, video designer, pulls me over to, the, to his table and you know, array of, array of um, inc you know, incredible monitors. And he said, here's what I've done. I have in this computer Hill Valley. I have all the streets in Hill Valley. I even have streets that are not in the movie. I've created it. Um, that car, which is you know, sitting in front of me on, the, on our stage, if you tell the car to do turn right, turn left, and to go forward, it will drive down any street in Hill Valley you want it to. And I went, I can't believe that. Like, what? Okay, so let's, let's do this. Um, and so we started to dream up a journey for the car. And, you know, turn right, turn left, turn left, and then go down the straightaway and do a 360. Um, and uh, as soon as the car moved, the video world around it shifted. And I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's extraordinary. That's really, 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 really cool. And as we kept going, I realized, ah, this is really actually brilliant and could just really save the day. So jump to some really smart producing. We, we, we get the most advanced uh, video screen you can possibly get and we purchase it as opposed to renting it. And um, we realize that, and this is the same one, of course, that they're using over at the Mandalorian, and all of this technology is even heightened over there more f further. But the idea of having a real object in front of a video uh, uh, world, and at the same time, which is what we do differently, then we have a front uh, projection. So we're able to do lots of different things with it that uh, you can't quite do in, in television or film. Um, and that's essentially how, how we got started, and then it was just, uh, essentially just a bunch of us playing with toys uh, to make it all to make it all make sense and work and then you know then in integrating the actors in it and then the classic clock tower sequence where we had to develop something for for Roger to do <laughs> on so we built a jungle gym for him to play on <laughs> And then, uh, then we had this crazy idea that, that it would just keep never stop. And Roger would literally not ever stop moving on this clock tower. And I'm like, how can we do that? And they say, well, the, well, we'll just do the same thing we do with the car. We'll just make the 3D world of the, of the clock tower follow it across the stage. And so that's what's going on. And there's Roger. And then when he gets to the wing, there's like, what, four or six lights? And he's got a yeah. duck. And he's got, it's, it's incredibly stupid to do this and unsafe. But it's just so much fun. <laughs> well, now guy. I'm going to take it down to Roger and to Casey. Like, Roger, the first time you're up on the clock tower, like, yeah. what is it like being up there? For those of you, how, how many people have seen the Broadway musical? Fabulous. It's one of the most amazing things. I've gone six, seven times to this thing. I don't even know how they do it. And it's amazing every time you go back. Talk about like being on the clock tower. What it, what, what, what is that like? Oh, it's it's super fun. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, you're, I'm about nine feet up, nine oh, feet up. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, uh, uh, my shins have, are, will never be the same. That's <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Um, there's a, you know, a little platform and uh, we tried to kind of echo a little, of what we could do, you know, I, I'm I'm an old guy, so I can't can only be only so much of Harold Lloyd, and um and the and we can only do so much crazy. Yeah. We we tried many different things for a while. We actually had me on a trapeze, um, you know, sorry. yeah. I'm sorry, are we you had, serious? We had Foy for a moment come, yeah. and we yeah, he was he was flying. Was Roger flying. was flying. I was I was going you know, down. If, if yeah. you recall in the in the movie, he, it was really he cool. Kind of goes yeah. down. He sort of rides down a cable and then. It, the, the bush branch breaks or something. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. We didn't couldn't do that on stage, though we tried. <laughs> yeah. And so I hopped off into a onto a a, um, a trapeze, <laughs> yes. and then kind of glided down, and then a 
a projection. Of a the little, projection made him look of like a he was falling. GI Joe guy it was, was incredible. On the front and it was, it, it was crazy. It was really. Fun. It was really <laughs> good. It was really cool. But we cut it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like the original. It was too long. It was, like, it was too long. It's like twelve minutes, and then yeah, I think, yeah, or, yeah. or eight minutes, and now we got it down to. No, it was twelve, 12 and then we got it down to seven. To seven, yeah. So yeah, we cut yeah. five minutes of juicy fun yeah. stuff. So yeah, they kept saying, really you know, this movie sequence is only six thirty. You know, you're a little long. Yeah, yeah. It's heartbreaking to lose all that juicy stuff. But it's really, I mean, it's really fun, and it's. It's it's not so acrobatic, is it? You just I just have had some friends come to the show and say, so you know they they're really intrigued with how you know yeah. how did it happen? How did you do that? Are you uh, clearly you're wired? And I'm like, I'm just wired from caffeine, not from yeah. Uh, any, <laughs> it's so any true. Topic. He does. He's not. He's it's not just wired. Totally you know, unsafe. It's, yeah, it's, it's really it's, unsafe, and yeah. I don't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> It's, but, kind of, it's but really fun. We did, you know, the the, the clock tower crumbles. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it's a great little yeah, thing. Yeah. And uh, it was like, oh, Roger, wouldn't it be cool if you if you just like slipped off the edge? <laughs> right. like, God. Uh, yeah, and then you can dangle and hang there. And he's like, oh yeah, Rando, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then we thought of this idea that the video could crumble. Like we could make the video crumble if he if we timed it all right. Yeah. And it it's so Someday funny. Someday I'll see it's it. It's so stupid. Yeah. But the best stupid thing is the staircase because we had to we had to put oh, that was a riot, we, we had yeah. to put Doc we had to make staircase. Doc. You know, go up the tower top, yeah. and it's like, yeah. how are you going to do this? Well, so the first time we did, my it, God, we had a we had a weird little, uh, like a, a <laughs> foot and a half high block and a and a strange um, hydraulic exercise set that that, <laughs> that the steps were about this fast at best. <laughs> so we couldn't, you know, and, and little by little, I kept on getting hurt coming off of it, and. Little by little, we would just cut more and more of it, and then finally we just said, "Just run in place on stage," which ended up being <laughs> so funny. Right? It, yeah, it's just such. It so it's, it's sometimes but, that's the best theater. Yeah, yeah. It's just the simplest, <laughs> simplest, simplest theater. You know, you know. And then we've had this, you know, amazing car. So why not just do something just like something that? Dumb, you know. And just, we, you know, Casey and I try to do like the, you know, the, you know, Greek tragedy right before. No, I'm going. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Right before it, so that we just we just cap it with this piece of ridiculous uh, stairway business. So it's always so funny. But we're so – Casey and I are so serious before that. Yeah, we're really dropped we're in. We're spitting on each other and saving each other's lives. Yeah. It's yeah. great stuff. <laughs> and the rain in the rain. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and when we first rehearsed it, Roger was like, "Turn up this rain! Turn, Turn up yeah. the rain! We yeah, want to blow our voices out on this." It's true. We, we, it was so hard. that was the hardest thing in the studio before we had a rainstorm and anything. It was just we were, we were basically in science. We were going, "No, I will not go!" You know, we're just yelling right right next to each other, thinking, "I hope the sound will be loud." You know, like, pray. You know, because we're just. We're trying to really sell the storm. And uh, John, how many times did I beg for a big fan off the stage? Because I wanted my hair to go back. You know, I really wanted a hair thing, you know. Fabio Doc. I want a Fabio Doc, yeah. <laughs> many people actually have referred to me as yeah, that. Yeah, a lot of people have said that That's to me That's the only one I did my, my, my shirtless scene. Yeah, though. the shirtless. Yeah. We cut the, the yeah. shirtless scene. signing your name now as Fabio? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what would the you, tango what would that you we say did. about um, not being up on the clock tower. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mean sitting in my car? Yeah, yeah, yeah just, you know. about the car, being just in the car. Um, well, I will say it is very small, and there is one brief moment where I'm turn while he's doing the clock tower part, where I turn upstage and a fan hits me, and it's my favorite part <laughs> because it's the fan that blows the smoke. It is basically that car is legitimately they. It is just a wood shell, and it is. Uh, it is very small, so there's a specific way to get into it, um, and uh, um, it's fun. I mean, honestly, it's not the job he's got in that part, but it is fun because we kind of I I I we kind of run around each other doing different physical beats. He's doing this. Uh, He's doing that little run up the stairs, and then I'm getting ready in the wing to run back out. We're gonna switch locations. We're back in front of the clock tower, and then we I do a whole bit there, and then I drive the car, and then I get out of the car, and then I I plug the thing in, and I do a hood slide, and uh, I feel like an action hero, and then I get in, and then he's back. I mean, it's literally just like there's like just like several minutes of Roger and I just like in blackouts between little moments uh, running to do the next piece. And it's it's like the most insane thing I've ever done. Yeah, the, with Tim Hatley, the set designer, when we were first creating this, we he storyboarded first through pictures of the film, and then we picked highlight moments. We would skip a couple and then yes, yes, yes. And we got a collection of those. And then we thought, okay, many of these we can do. There's some that maybe not. And there's some others that we might want to try that are a little different. 
And so then we brought in a storyboard artist who helped us as we described what we were trying to create. And then the storyboard artist from that, Tim took those and then he did his own storyboards with it, which were really extraordinary. All the while we're working also in a model form, this incredible little model where, I mean, literally they came to me and they said, okay, uh, John, how do you, and they handed me the model of this. I mean, it's really just like, you know, the kind you might build as a 12 year old, you know, your glue and all of that. And they put it in a box at the theater, a black box. And I'm like, okay, that's gonna work. And then, you know, okay, I want it to do this and I kind of want to curve around and do that. And then we were doing this incredible rehearsal. Uh, sorry, I'm just going way go, off tangent. I'll go, go quick. Go. Um, uh, yeah, we were doing this incredible rehearsal where, where we were, uh, it was a workshop and we were working on the show and Tim Hatley brought everything he had from his studio to the rehearsal space. We had another room for him and this was two yeah. weeks in and we were working on the show. At the same time, we were trying to create the design and Bob Zemeckis was there, the original, and then we, Bob Gale was there and we were like, every, we had to show them what we were doing. And um, we had this incredible moment where they said, John, they came up to me, I was rehearsing something, they came up to me, I, we need you now. And I said, uh, okay, uh, you know, Chris will choreograph, I'll go. Okay, we have an idea about how the, car's going to fly. Now, up to this point, our producer goes, you know those balloon cars that fly out over the thing and they go out over the house and they'll come back? And I'm like, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> Whatever, you know, a lot of money for a balloon. Yeah, can we get the actors in it? No. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so then, this really, this really crazy thing, they said, okay, we have this thing that we're going to do. And they said, what if the car, what if the car literally just lifts up? And I'm like, oh, that's great, that's great, yeah, yeah. And they said, okay, then it's gonna turn, and then it's gonna go towards you, towards the audience, and then we're gonna get it to go over the audience. And I'm like, oh, that's great, that's perfect, no problem. <laughs> and then they said, and then we're gonna make it do a full 360 yeah. and turn around and go off upstage. And I was like, a full 360 with the actors inside? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we can do that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, so that's how that came about. Literally, just like that. Just like a little model, yeah. this is what we're gonna do. You all have an incredible audience that comes to the show. Like, so I've been to like six, seven times to this show. This is the happiest audience on Broadway that comes to your show. I mean, you're such a feel-good show. I'll start with Jelani down there. What do you think the appeal is? Uh, audiences love this show, tell me why. Yeah, I think obviously because of the brand of Back to the Future, they're yeah. excited to, to relive it, but then when they get there and see what what joy we get to put on stage, and the joy that we have doing the show, I think yeah. radiates. I know for my character, I get to be that little glimmer of positivity and, and spark a little sunshine throughout the whole show, and yeah. I love that responsibility. But looking out at the audience, it's more so seeing people that grew up with a movie now have kids, you yeah. know, and they get to sit next to their loved one and have this wonderful theatrical experience. And for a lot of them, it's their first time in a theater and they get to sort of experience our show as that first gateway into the magic that we get to do. So it's it's a great responsibility and also it's it's important. I think audience feels safe coming to our show and they get to escape and, and have a great time. Yeah, I mean, I echo that 100%. It's it's nostalgia, it's escaping, it's um, bringing generations together, families that come yeah. and, and the parents who've loved this movie their whole lives get to introduce their kids to it and, and it's something that brings them together and they bond and, and then maybe they bring them home and show them the film and then their kids fall in love with this thing that they've loved their whole lives and it's, it's a spectacle but it really has heart as well you know hopefully if we're doing our jobs yeah. correctly you're you're falling in love with the characters and the story and you're transported from the minute you get in your seat i've always said it feels like this magical blend of a Broadway musical meets cinema, thanks to Alan Silvestri's gorgeous underscoring we have throughout the show, meets like a, a hint of an amusement park ride, you know? With the lights and the sound, it feels like this incredible immersive experience. And it, I think it really transports audiences for all, you know, two and a half hours. And yeah. especially these days, that's a really wonderful thing, you know? Can I also add also, 
I get to watch a lot of the show. Um, it's also feels custom. Every yeah. show is custom to that audience. You know, you yeah. don't get the same thing twice, especially with like yeah. Casey and Roger get to do out there. It's, it's custom. So it's like a one of a kind experience you get each show. Thanks for that. Hey, anytime. <laughs> You look really good but in, it's that, true. in that purple. Don't do this. I really love <laughs> Don't <that>. do this. <laughs> <laughs> so but great. it's true. What they do out there, this community art, this vaudeville, that they bounce off each other and then the audience is included on it. It's like we're all in it together. So but it's, Jelani, it's, you're doing it too vocally yeah. and, and spiritually. And I mean, th the other night when I was there and saw, the, 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 got to start somewhere, this song that he performs just effortlessly and brilliantly. Uh, you know, I've seen it many, many times. I've seen him do it many, many times. And it was even greater <laughs> and more glorious uh, uh, a moment in our show. And it just, it is true. The, the, the instantaneous feel with the audience is really special. Mm. Yeah. I think um, we had a, an audience in, um, in, in, in uh, Champion Charities um, yeah. booked out the entire theater. And I didn't know what that was. I knew it was Champion Charities. I was like, cool, okay, full house, great. And uh, they did a speech beforehand. And it was all kids who had essentially never seen theatre before. Never been in a theatre before. And I was like, let's go. This is what it's all yeah. about. And forget Back to the Future. Forget, like, biggest film ever made, arguably. Best film ever made, arguably. They didn't care. They didn't know. They were just there to watch a piece of theatre for the first time. And it was clear that our show with the positivity yeah. and the fun, they went nuts. And that was an incredibly emotional and borderline life-changing experience for me. Cause I was like, yeah. this is what it's all about. That's the beauty of our show, I think, is that you get people yelling out at George. Yeah. You get people yelling out and that's fine. Do it if you want, I don't care. Because if we're, you know, it's theater darling. But um, <laughs> it, if we're, if, if you can, move an audience member to a point where they're going, come on, George, Yeah. then that's great. And that's a show that I want to be in. Um, and these kids had never seen Back to the Future. They didn't know, oh, that's exactly like the film. They were just like, they were in it. And that's the beauty about the, the, the 3D experience of what all of these people create is that the performance is obviously world-class, but also the technical elements that you're not watching Back to the Future, you're in it, if yeah. you know the film or not. And that is uh, the, the excellence of, of the show that we create, I think. All right, I think yep. that's good. Yep. good? <laughs> um, great, great answer. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, this is, I know this is sag after, but I want to produce someday as well. Um, so I really keep my mind like on the ground about all these things. And I, I, I feel like right now we're in this moment where uh, we can't, all agree on theater. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a it's a, it's a constant kind of battle of of uh, critical analysis and and audience uh, sh uh, uh, response uh, versus audience uh, um, showing up. And um, it's it is very nice to be in something that is undeniable, yeah. and it is something that um, has lasted from the beginning of the season. Um, we're in nine months now. And we've been extended till December. Um, and, uh, and there's more companies coming around the world. Um, and uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of theories of what are, what are people looking for um, uh, in theater right now. And um, I think what is great is that the people who end up in our theater are always satisfied. Yeah. And they don't leave with um, the expectations they came in with. Um, not met, and uh, that's great. And we have and we have um, fans that are a few of them are here tonight um, that uh, have come back eighteen times yeah. because uh, we have people that have come you, you, like like Jelani said the show's different all the time, and we definitely try to stay as close to <laughs> what's written as possible. Um, but uh, but yeah, I hopefully I, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Roger, audiences for you. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I love I love the audiences of our show. They're so funny. They're you know the, the fun thing about we've had really rowdy ones and really <laughs> as Hugh said you know that they're one of the first times we did the show in London again in Manchester actually uh, the the we were so thrilled by the way they got behind George. You, know, you got to yeah. get behind George's story. It's really important they get behind us too. But 
when he that very very first time when you when you hit him and then also just oh it, there's so many I mean yeah. there's just so, so many it's so yeah. it's so it was so thrilling and we just couldn't wait to get back on stage because we knew the audience was so along for this ride and sometimes you know we 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 will play to so gratefully too we'll play to the balcony filled with kids that yeah. are between um, ten and about fifteen and. Many of them, you know, they don't, sometimes they, we, the, the teachers will say, now behave, you know. And so they'll be very quiet. But we know every time we do one of those performances that about three or four of them, I promise you, will be forever changed, as Hugh was saying, and will, and will maybe even dedicate their lives to being an entertainer or being involved in entertainment, yeah. that we've turned their world upside down. No matter how quiet sometimes they can be and not, not participating in, in, in our shtick as much as we'd love. But we, but not a lot of nine-year-olds understand vaudeville. Yeah, references. not particularly, it's but they really, will. They will. That's my understand. job. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, we like to. We like to pass that on. But um, <laughs> but it's 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 really something, and and our and our show does that. Fred, you know it too. Oh yeah. Um, it 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 really is for a lot of young people who see it. It really turns them on. They really get excited by it. And you know, we're 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 thrilled to be part of something that is that pushes the envelope technically, but also maintains a sort of old-fashioned beauty and warmth and charm to it and 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 we knew it when we were adding a lot of the soundscape to it yeah. uh, in rehearsal it was i was a little concerned like are we are we going too technical are we going to lose them are we going to uh, make it cold on some level but we do an interesting hybrid and i think that it excites a lot of a lot of kids who are used to going into movie theater or used to be you know, going yeah. to movie theaters and get very excited by the sound and the intensity and we we bring a lot of intensity to for them and and i think they find it very engaging and i think that thing is we talk about um everything from a flying car yeah. all the way to vaudeville tit for tat diddle it, diddle it, diddle it, making the audience like classic call and response they like that do a little bit more do a little bit more and if, if you're nine years old maybe you don't go oh the brilliance of old style vaudeville right? <laughs> but, but what they do do yeah. is because i had a kid yesterday who came to the show from champion charities and her takeaway was god doc and martin look like best friends yeah. and that's something you teach kids and that's what you're talking about like they can either go come away and go wow you can fly a car in the theater i want to do this or yeah. they're terrified of getting on stage but they know they want to do it but they only think that to act is to get on stage and do it very robotically to watch these two do yeah. what they do and go oh you can just be best friends. It doesn't have to be, theater isn't one thing. It can be like having all the fun in the world and, and looking like you're the best friends ever. Yeah. It could freeze a child and they can go, I can be whoever I wanna be and I can dare whatever I want. I can sing like Jelani, you know, we can act, do whatever we do. You can have all the fun in the world. Make out, <laughs> you know? we can kiss. We can kiss, exactly. It's, it's, that's the best bit for the audience, especially kids who come to our show, it's like, you can do whatever you want in this theater and theater as an art form is yeah. losing to movies. It's losing to cinema and films and video games, but it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was is, just gonna yeah. uh, add one thing, uh, which is- John um, never gets interviews, so this is very exciting. <laughs> yeah. it's, good. It's, good. <laughs> it's true. Um, I just wanna say, <laughs> I just wanna say, um, yeah, and you you know this better than many, Richie, uh, is, um, you know, I, I working in the theater for me um, has always been about um, spreading joy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really believe in that. I really think that that's, um, that there's a healing power to joy um, for two hours, two and a half hours, that actually, you know, tickling you and 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 hearing great fun rock and roll songs and um yeah that that joy is so important to me it's it's what what i do um and uh this this is just you know done with such heart um to to make people feel a little bit happier yeah. especially in our world right now where in the, and in the theater which i just adore and worship uh so many of what's going on right now because it it is a lot about trying to make the world a better place or trying to change the world, or, which I firmly, firmly and strongly believed in. I was a Brechtian in high school. Yeah. Um, but um, spreading joy is just a part of that. It's yeah. just a small part of that. And uh, I'm just glad we can, I can you know, help fill that place, um, especially with these 
incredible people. Um, yeah, yeah. Beautifully put. Well, I'll tell you, you know, yeah. this guy, uh, he does, I mean, it, it, John, he runs a joyous room, you know. He, yeah. it's, he lets us be free, yeah. and we laugh. We laugh. We worked hard, but we laughed so much. So, and that joy is, it was infectious. And it, it, you can, in every company so far, it's always been one of the primary emotions that I think everybody has when they're rehearsing it and when they're doing the show. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I just want to add one last thing, which is what Chalani brought up, which is, and this is a, you know, this is heresy on Broadway, and I shouldn't be saying this. Um, but I'm going to say it anyway with the risk of just, you know, wanting to have Broadway be really, truly, in a way, entertainment, entertainmently diverse, too. Um, so um, so when I was in uh, going to grad school at UCLA in the 80s, uh, Back to the Future, the ride opened at um, Universal Studios. And, you know, I, it was a must go to. It was a must experience thing. And I did that. And, you know, walking through that, you know, when Spielberg was involved and, and Bob was involved and Bob Z was, everybody was involved, Alan, they were all involved in that, in that um, thing. And, you know, just walking through and going, oh, wow, this is so great. You know, you're, it's one of the first immersive things that yeah. was, you know, happened. And so when we were working on this show, I'm like, you know, guys, there's no more Back to the Future ride, but you know, there is a video on YouTube of what it was like. And so, and there's a great thing that we did for Broadway only. We, we have a, there's a dinosaur in the ride. And so like, oh, yeah. cool, we'll put the dinosaur in the top of 20, 21st uh, century song. And so, um, and I just want to say that while we were doing this too, I happened to be working in China. I do musicals in yeah. China, Richie. <laughs> I do musicals in China, in Chinese. Um, and spread joy there. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so uh, they have a ride. They had a ride. They have it now here. But they had a ride at Disney, Shanghai Disneyland called Tron. And I went on this. Uh, uh, ex and I experienced this. And as soon as I got off, I, I messaged Tim Hatley. Yeah. And I said, I've just experienced what I think our show can be. Um, it's, in it's just Amazing, and and you'll recognize when you walk into the theater, the blue lighting, the way the thing. You'll recognize there's a nod yeah. to to Tron in that too as well, which I shouldn't be telling you yeah. because I know it's heresy to have theme park ideas on Broadway. I understand, but hey, it's cool and it's entertaining, and you know what? It spreads joy. Yes, it does. We have a, a room full of actors here. We have uh, many actors who will be watching this afterwards. I'd like to ask about auditioning. Are each of you good at auditioning? And how did you perfect your auditioning skills? And how do you put the voices, those negative voices we hear as actors, because you have no idea when you open that door, what's going to happen, who's going to be on the other side. Where do you put those voices? And what is a perfect audition for each of you? We have to start down here. No, sure. we don't well, have no, to. I, I feel like we need time to think before, before about this. Jelani one. <laughs> would love to think. Yeah, I mean, he's that? always. He, yeah, exactly. Everyone else gets time to think while no, no. Jelani Rodney. brings it. But yeah, yeah. Um, John, have you, you auditioned for a few things, Wait, didn't you? I did mean, you? I, in his day, yeah, I think you did. You were an actor at first, right? Yes. Were you good yes. at it? Mm, Auditioning? In, in, no. <laughs> I'm a good auditioner, but you know what? A lot of times when we Roger, try to explain Roger used a lampshade. I use a lampshade. Yeah, but. I would make him always do the scenes for me because it was my favorite thing ever, you know. So uh, it's like just I said, just don't try, to, just please do it, John, please. And I would, it was always you remember hilarious when he does it always. So he's very good. He just doesn't want to audition. He hates auditioning. Um, auditioning is like you know, it's 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 just hit or miss. It's like life. It's like a it's like having lunch with somebody. It's you, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're in the mood, sometimes you're not. You know, it's not a it it we we. You know, when we want it really bad, we, yeah. we put all this stuff on it. But yeah. really, the best things that ever happen to me are when I'm tired or don't care or... Are we still talking about auditions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> just for sure. You just, know what I mean? You know, like, so, like, you know, and, 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 and it's different now because, you know, they're, they're, we have to put ourselves on tape and everybody yeah. who's watching this knows what that whole thing is like. Yeah. And it's, you know, even that, I've had times where I just want to amuse myself and and those often will get the job you know um and and then but also you have time to study your dumb face which is really hard and i think the voices that, that richie was just talking about you know that you go oh my god i could never so it's 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 
you, you, you know, eventually, you know, you look at the deadline, you, you know, you don't have to send it, but eventually you press send and you, sometimes you hear, sometimes you don't. And I just think it, it you know, it's not, it's not quite as mystical as people think, you know, most of the time, everybody in the room is, is, is really rooting for you. Yeah. And then there are times when I've walked in where it is clearly cast and I've yeah. worked so hard on it. And after it's over, they go, wow, we just, thank you so much. That was so great to meet you. And you just thought that was so much work. But then there are other times when you walk in and it's like, we still don't have the guy. We still don't have the guy. And then your tape rolls in and you're just the right dumbass to get it. You know what I mean? It's like, that, it's just the right right guy and they like thank goodness Roger Bart sent a dumb tape <laughs> so it, it, so so demystify it that's yeah. what i would sort of say and yeah. and have fun you know everybody and I, part of this is also cuz i'm you know i'm 61 like i at this point it's like most of the people i'm auditioning for are younger <laughs> so i don't care <laughs> as much i just don't care as much you know they're they're probably you know I don't, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's something that happens with age too. So I'll be curious as we, now we, well, we'll, we'll hear from this youthful, incredible lad what his take is on it. I think it's really serious actually, Roger. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, 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 It no. is serious, no. but it's, yeah. but yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I love uh, my friendship with Roger for, for a multitude of reasons, but uh, uh, specifically, um, that that uh, me at my age and him at as he also to a couple years older age. Um, we we connect and we believe the same things. I mean, it's like where we both get insecure. We both uh, are yeah. get uh, confident when we we feel something is right. And um, I, I I really love the idea of demystifying the process for sure. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is that I I definitely feel like. Um, the jobs that I have gotten have made no sense, um, and some of them have, and there's no, there's nothing, there's no, there's no pattern um, at yeah. all. Um, but I will say that it, it really, um, and and whatever you believe in, uh, 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 there's definitely been a, a plan. There's definitely been a plan for how my um, my life and career have have gone, and the jobs that I have missed out on uh, have always made room for something that was necessary sure. to my growth yeah. um, as a person or or as an artist. Um, for example, there's stuff, there's stuff on Broadway. There's 14 freaking shows that are opening in the yeah. next few weeks. And uh, uh, there's a lot of people on Broadway that have had their hands in certain things and they can't make all of their babies uh, uh, come, you know, they can't raise all their babies themselves. Now things are moving on without them. And uh, but 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 we all make these choices and these, these this weird greater plan has ended up working out for me and I, I, this job I wasn't supposed to do this job I was in almost famous the musical last year on Broadway and flex. um, um yep. well thank you thank you very flex, much thank flex, you flex 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 oh all two of you showed up thank you thanks um <laughs> and uh and and I wasn't I wasn't able to do Back to the Future and uh, that show closed early which was extremely yeah. sad because it was an extremely special show but uh, it made room for this. So it's like um, now it, you're just famous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. <laughs> I don't. I always. Uh, I I find it so weird um, giving advice. Like I just because I've got a microphone. Like I don't care what I think. Do you know what I mean? Especially with like auditions. Um, it, I think the demystifying thing is hundred percent like. Philip Seymour Hoffman oh, said, if someone's renting a room for you to act in, you go in there and you do your best and then you get the train to go home. You know, it's that thing of like, I, I came out of drama school and I used to go into auditions shaking, just like, oh God, I need this job, please. And then it just, it, was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. I didn't enjoy getting on the train. I didn't enjoy the audition. I didn't enjoy going home and it wasn't why I became an actor and it, 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 it was rubbish. And then I, it was sort of like a mental switch where I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist for whatever that's worth. And, and my body and my voice is my paint and my whatever. And they've rented this room in, you know, New Diorama in Warren Street in London or be it on Sunset Boulevard or 42nd Street, wherever. They've rented that room. I've, you've given me your material. And this is what I think it is. And th that's how I go into it. It's just like this for what it's worth, this is what I think it is. And usually that's not what's on the page. Something very different. Um, but if they don't want that, that's fine. 
that's fine because a, a, I think you said, what's a successful audition? A successful audition is me at home with a coffee in my pajamas going, oh, what is this? What, how do I want to do this? Not what is it? Yeah. How do I want to do this? What story do I want to tell? What's a compelling story? And I come up with something completely different and I go in with sort of like a, I know this isn't what you asked for, but this is what I'm going to give you. If you don't want that, that's fine. I'll go get a yeah. prep and go home. But if it is what you want, then let's go. Because as the actor, you've gone, here's a strong choice, really strong, too strong, way too strong. But if you think you can tone that down with yeah. notes in the room, or you're just like, God, we never thought it was gonna be like that, but what's, what's he doing? That's the best. When you're in an audition room yeah. and you do something and you see them go, but it's like a positive, like, what is he doing? Um, that is, that's a successful audition. Yeah. And then you get it, you don't get it because someone much more famous than you is up for it or is already cast or whatever, but you can go home and go, I acted well. Yeah. And there's no greater feeling than that. Do you know what I mean? Beautiful. Yeah, I think um, 100%. I think um, I resonated with what Roger said as well. The first, um, my first Broadway show I ever got I remember that audition. I was so anxious and nervous for I was prepared. I was thinking about it all the time. And then that morning I woke up and was uh, very sick, vomiting oh. for hours. And I called my agents and they were, I was like, I can't go. I've been sick all morning. And they were like, well, it's the only day the teams gather. And so they were like, if there's anything you can do. And I remember I like pulled myself off the bathroom floor, grabbed saltines and ginger ale. And I went in and I was so tired I didn't have enough energy to care and it was like one of the best auditions and I booked it wow. because I had I was forced to let go and I remember they were like just can you like do big circles running all around the room and I was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and at that point it was like hell here goes <laughs> And it, it led to magic that I would not have had if I were the best version of myself, doing yeah. the best version I had prepared of the material. And that really stayed with me. Um, so I think it's a combination. It is. It does make no sense half the time, but I do like to be as prepared as possible because I think that awards you the freedom to then get in the room and try things knowing that you don't need to cling to the, what is the word, what is the note? So over preparing and then being able to step in the room yeah. and let it go and see what happens. And I remember uh, one time when I, I hadn't worked in a while and I was going on, I was going to an audition and um, I wanted it, of course, because I wanted to work. And then it occurred to me, I was like, isn't it special that I get to, for this job that I'm doing, I get to show up in a room and show a little bit of my soul. That's, that's my job today, is I get to share a little piece of my soul with this room, and then I leave. And um, that also really resonated with me. I think sometimes I think of auditioning as sharing a little bit of my soul. And whether they need it for this job or not, I got to do that, and it leaves you a lot of times on this high, even if it went poorly, of like, it's an it's exhilarating. Um, of course, you know, the hard part is once you've poured your heart and soul into, you have to pour your heart and soul yeah. into something in order to do a great job. You know, I think the practice comes with learning to let go after. Yeah. And also there's one last thing. I feel like sometimes we feel like Olympic athletes when we get to the stage of like final callbacks. Because you, it's like you have to, it's it's like you're performing in the Olympics. You have to land it on so many levels in front of a huge team, producers, 20 people, and you feel like, I did it, or maybe you didn't, but if it goes well, I did it, I, I won the event. And then sometimes, like I think for this, I went in five times. So I felt like I had to land it five times, and it's yeah. it's, that is a bit of a, that's where the, I guess, the mind game comes in, and you just, you work, you work and work with, you know, therapists and coaches to learn how to, <laughs> lots of therapy, to learn how to get in the zone, just like in an athlete would. Like, get in the zone, clear the disturbing thoughts that want to, you know, interfere and just, yeah. and uh, drop in and do your best. Day one on our first reading, yeah. um, Liana and I connected as mother and son when we both popped our beta blockers. Oh, <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> the, uh, beta blocker helps with the we physical. Each other, we go. You too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it helps with the physical symptoms of anxiety, which is like racing heart and, yeah. and trembling. So on opening night, I texted Casey, "What time are we popping the betas?" <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think you're exactly right. It is like an Olympic sport going to these auditions, but at the end of the day, I know. I think I speak for everyone. We love this sport. 
yeah. right? We love the sport and we love the comrades that we meet and the, the adventures that we get to have through it. I think my best auditions are when I get to exhale and connect, yeah. which is so crazy because we have what, three minutes to figure it out and, and, and breathe and, and deliver. But I, I, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that they saw Jelani as well as the character they're looking for. Um, my whole career started from a no. And that's when I, I tell all my students now that no doesn't mean no, it means not right now. Right. So I didn't get that job, but they wanted to see me for another job, which I booked. Um, but it was from that no and, and turning that into, you know, growth and turning that into, OK, well, as long as they saw me, they, they thought I could be good for another project. Yeah. So I realized that connections are important. Being kind is important and just exhaling and, and staying true to yourself as best as you can, because they're looking for you. Right. They're looking yeah. for you and not a carbon copy of somebody else. They're looking for you. And as I get wiser and, and have more experiences, I find that every job or or profession I've had performing has prepped me for the next step. So going from show to show to show, picking up the truths and the lessons that I've learned and, and taking them to the next gig has been a wonderful sort of like Olympic sport. Beautiful. And put the sides in the bin. As yeah. soon as you leave the room, yes. put the sides yeah. in the bin. Because if you hang yeah. on to the sides, you're not going to get the job. Oh, I keep them, especially the, the ones that I can. <laughs> um, just so, just for anyone who else who was wondering. And, and if they were rude to you, rip them up before you put them in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. My final question. Yeah, yeah, yeah piece yeah, them together. Yeah. My final question is for John. You are one of the most respected directors working in this business. Let's hear it for John Rando. Yeah. I have known this man for a very, very, very long time. He's also one of the nicest people. And like you, the actors were all saying, he, he, puts, he makes such a beautiful, fun, and positive room. But what do you look for in an audition room? Yeah, you know, I, everything they say is true. Yeah. You know, it's just like, oh, uh, is there, is it, is there a, a, a vibe, a good vibe? Yeah. Is there a, is it relaxation? Is there, are, they, are they feeling like they've done well? Because that always helps. Yeah. But you know, the, the, the issue that we have behind the table is that it's not just me, it's the writer, yeah. it's the composer, it's the choreographer, it's the music director. Um, so, you know, like for example, Marty McFly, you know, it's already hard enough to do Marty McFly because of the Michael J. Fox thing. But then we have this standard in the show, which is yeah. the song called, uh, you know, power, the, the Power of Love, which, you know, we play in the original key and it's really high. Yeah. It's really high. And then when we created the show, Everything that this character sings is in that. So then it's like, how do they do it? Because you'll get an actor who can do the, you see the heart and then they try to hit the, and they can't yeah. hit the notes. And then it's like, oh my God, wow. How are we going to find this? And we, we, um, you know, we, I scouted Casey and I was all, you know, at the, at the almost famous, yeah. you know, like, why isn't that kid coming in? I think he's got, we got this role that he might want. So it, you know, it's like, uh, so I was very patient and, uh, and would see, you know, Marty after Marty, but, but, um, you know, sort of knew that there was another one out there that I really wanted in the show. And, um, and then, you know, it's just so, so I just want to say the table is as, as Leanna described, it's it's a big table. There's a yeah. lot of people behind me, and they have a lot of say because they're putting money in it, or they they or they are composers or lyricists. So it's a very complicated room for this to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, most importantly, I just want the actors to feel like they're 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 respected, they're loved by me, that that I care, that I know how difficult it is because I was there yeah. in my early career, <laughs> which ended very quickly. Thank God, <laughs> I went on to directing. Um, and uh, so yeah, so so just uh, just making sure that they feel like they can execute what they can do best, and then then once that's happened, then it's about all these other factors. Yeah. Um, and then you just, you know, fingers crossed that it all comes together f for you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, John. I really appreciate that. That kind of Well, I just want to close on this. I, it's something that Casey picked up on. I've been going to Broadway since I was 10 years old. And like I said, there's always something on Broadway. There should be something different in every theater. And like I said, this is one of the most joyous and happy musicals you will ever see on Broadway. And like I said, I've been going since I was 10 years old. I've seen your show six times already. Like I said, there is something for everyone. You will have the time of your life at Back to the Future. I want to thank this incredible company for taking out a Thursday afternoon before they go into their big, you know, Fridays and Saturdays and everything else. Let's hear it for the company of Back to the Future, the musical.